Hey, you're tuned into Sacred Erotic with Gil and Nehemia, another episode, exciting one, with Maura Mark Steiner from mybirthprepwithmora.com. I'm very excited to introduce her today, just an, a really exciting topic, something that I normally don't talk about, so I'll let Maura introduce herself. Thanks, Gila. I'm so excited to be here today. I am a board-certified music therapist, board-certified in the United States, and I work with families who are expecting babies, which is like a niche within a niche within a niche. <laughs> and um, it's I help families prepare for their birth in a very holistic way. So I am really interested in helping families understand this concept that you're going to birth with your whole self. This might come out of your body physically or your partner's body physically, but you are bringing so many things to the table. And really, as we prepare for birth, we are actually given an opportunity to change our life and to develop life skills. So I'm helping families um, tap into their emotions, use those as a guide, that kind of inner intuition. I'm helping them communicate better with each other as well as understanding the physiological processes, understanding how to put a good team together, and understanding tools that they can use during the actual labor. And of course, one of those includes music therapy, as well as a couple others that I have just, you know, personal favorites that I always share with my, my families. Wow, that's um, a packed bio. Thank you so much for sharing that, Maura. <laughs> sure. for, for those of you that are just tuning in, this is Sacred Erotic with Gila Nehemi. I'm here with Maura Marksteiner. You can reach me at wildridersheal.com. You can reach Maura at mybirthprepwithmaura.com. And some of you may be thinking, so how does this all relate to desire? What is the, <laughs> what is the connection? Why am I interviewing Maura? As I might have said earlier, there are so many levels of desire, desire to have a child. And the actual, actually, Mora is a perfect example because I talk about life force as our sexual energy and the creative life force. And so the very act of having a child is the most divine. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that women can do, and, but it's also completely divine. Um, I'll have Mora really exp expound on that, but I think that that part of my biology of creating that child and then you know having us give birth I don't know I have no more words so I think more I'll give you the stage <laughs> yeah you know I think I really started tapping into our inherent nature as creators as I started to learn and understand more about pregnancy and it's our, our bodies are always creating right they're always creating new cells. It's, it's a function of our lives. We have to be in creation mode or else we will literally die because you can't have a cell that's dead that you can't create a new one for. But we don't think about that. We don't, you know, it just, it just happens for us. And unless something's wrong, we never really give two thoughts to it. But when, when you're expecting a baby, suddenly, suddenly your body's doing all these things that you're not used to. And you're, you're, you know, some people are really excited about it. Some people are really freaked out about it. Sometimes it's a mix. And, and you just start to tap into this, this part of yourself that is kind of other, but it is you. And uh, sometimes it's, it's a little, I want to say it's a little undervalued. You know, we kind of talk about crazy pregnancy brain and we talk about all of these things and, and it can feel other. It can feel strange because you haven't been living in that space, but pregnancy brain is just a different part of your brain that's always been there becoming more active. And many people touch into a new part of themselves during their pregnancy. You know, they, they touch into this intuition that they maybe weren't listening to before. And, and it's totally possible to have, to not listen to it during your pregnancy as well, but I talk to a lot of families who have had births and they'll say, you know, I really felt like this and this. And I know it sounds crazy because they have no, no left brain evidence for it, but tapping in, but they are tapping into it. They are more connected to it in a way that they couldn't deny before. And when we make space for those, those awarenesses and that kind of, that kind of dialogue and honor it, then we start to tap into a different part of ourselves. So you tap into yourself as the creator and uh, as a creator. And 
I absolutely tapped into my creative powers through art when I had been the person who said, oh, I'm not creative, even though I was a musician, even though I was a music therapist, I'm not creative. But it was during my pregnancy, my second pregnancy, that I thought, oh, wow, this is something that I can do and enjoy. And, and, and that's important. It, the creation doesn't, doesn't um, it's not inherent on, oh, we could put this in a museum. Who cares? You're creating. Like, that's important in your day-to-day life. Yes, that's really important, and I and I, I honor you for sharing that with us as um, as someone who's a music therapist and thought at one point that you weren't creative because I think that all human beings, actually any being on this earth, is creative. You know, um, animals may not think about it, but they are creative. Like we're all creative, and thank you for sharing that with us. So those listeners, whoever's thinking you're not creative, you are. <laughs> definitely, definitely. This may not be admitting it to yourself. <laughs> right. And when we put a judgment on it, like, oh, is this, is this as good as insert any artist? Then you limit yourself. You, you forget about the cool thing that you have and, you know, maybe other people won't appreciate it, but that's an expression of you and it's an extension of you. And that's just amazing that you would put it out there. Very yeah. vulnerable place to be. Right. Right. Totally. And you said a lot of uh, great things. I just wanted to highlight it for anybody who's listening or just coming in now. It's just that um, a pregnant woman as the other, you know, kind of seeing this other part of ourselves because we're normally not pregnant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, and I think that's a great point. You know, I, th- I really just hit home when you said that. So I, I just mm-hmm. wanted to, um, to highlight it. And, and I wanted to ask you, like, what really made you get into this kind of work? Like, were you kind of always into birth? Like, was it after you actually gave birth? Uh, mm-hmm. Share that with the audience and myself. Yeah. Well, I mean, looking back, you always look way back and say, oh, well, there is that little hint there. There is this little hint there. But it didn't really come to the forefront until after I had quite a couple years after I'd had my first son. I just intuitively knew during that birth that I wanted an unmedicated birth, but I had none of the life skills that I needed to really stand up for that. And so I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't honor my wishes with my actions. I was very closed off to the specific groups that really could have helped me do that. And I was, wholly relying, I, I basically, I call it not completing my circle of care. Cause I had, I had, you know, I was seeing an OB. Um, he was in retrospect, natural birth tolerant, not necessarily natural birth supportive. And so I thought I was really thinking of my birth just in terms of physiology and medical and and I would have some feelings come up and I'd kind of deal with what I needed to, but then I would just move on and not really sink into it because I was afraid of overwhelming myself. But so that birth ended up being gentle. It was not an unmedicated birth by any means, but it was gentle. It was peaceful. It was an okay experience. I did walk away feeling a little disillusioned, like, oh, this feels a little off, but I was happy to have my baby. And so I could like push that to the side. So I must have mentioned though during that pregnancy enough that I wonder what music therapy with expecting families would be like. And serendipity came into my life and I came across a workshop for families who, uh, or for music therapists who wanted to work with expecting families. And it, it was close. It was convenient. Like, I mean, it was just one of those moments when all the stars align and you're like, Oh, I'm going clearly I'm going. So I went and kind of from the first, it was, it was good because it almost forced me into a setting I never would have chosen to go into. Uh, I didn't really know that much about doulas. I didn't know that much about midwives. I didn't know that much about home birth. And here I was face to face with all of those things and really loving it and resonating. And, and um, I'll never forget that one of the first things that the trainers who are also all music therapists said was, well, a lot of people will have during their birth, um, they'll have a moment where they think they're going to die for just a a brief passing moment. And I'm not talking about like traumatic, like just that thought that passes right through your head. And she said, and some, some speculate that's the child self dying. 
And I was like, holy crap, I like literally thought that I didn't share it with anybody, but I really thought that during my first birth. And then the rest of the workshop, I think I must have had my mouth, like my jaw on the floor because they were explaining so many things that had happened or that I was experiencing and how, you know, how the, um, how your lips are connected to your cervix. So a lot of women will lick their lips or, you know, really want to eat things or, you know, really be focused on their lips. And it's because it's kind of reflective of what's going on in the cervix. And I remember being like, I totally had that happen. Uh, The downside was that I also, that's where I learned that my first doctor had been actually been medically inappropriate and had put me and my baby at risk. And like I said, things turned out okay, but it was, just the first time that I realized, oh my gosh, I had trusted this person to only do what was medically necessary, to only give me meds if it was absolutely necessary, and to point me towards anything, you know, given what I was sharing with him that I wanted this unmedicated birth, to point me towards any resources that would help me do that. And I was realizing there was so much that could have happened if I had had a different provider or a different kind of provider. So, as well that weekend i learned i was pregnant with my second son so (laughs) so it just opened up this context where i got to experience and then go through training i i went on to um, go through doula training i went on to become certified in a childbirth education course that incorporated art i have since then created my own childbirth education course that um, incorporates a whole bunch of different things that i kind of went over in my bio um, and then had I had my unmedicated birth, but I had to go through a whole bunch of growth during that that pregnancy, and it was really the vehicle for me to just change the way I'd been showing up for myself in my life. Um, I had to leave my care provider. I had to, you know, just all we hired a doula. We started at back at the drawing board with our birth at like everything, and it was it was just an amazing first steps into life in a different way. It was almost like a different life. And it's a journey that has continued for me in the, in the time since then. Wow. That's, that's an amazing story. A lot of things um, occurred in my head as I was listening to you or maybe feelings inside my body really. Um, (laughs) But one was, I just wanted to share that, um, you know, you had put an intention out there that you wanted to incorporate music therapy. You didn't know how you were going to do that. And then, you know, synchronicity, serendipity, whatever anybody wants to call it, occurred. The universe blessed you. (laughs) And and then you got you on this whole new journey, you know, and then you Mm -hmm. actually had this unmedicated birth with your second child. Right. It just goes to show once you put your desire out there, it's definitely going to be answered um, right. as long as you're fully hundred um, percent with that commitment of having, of doing that. And you know, the music really, I'm sorry to jump in, but the music really was this vehicle for that. I can't, I can't exactly explain what it was, but during that workshop, of course, I learned how to use music differently. Um, so I had training, even though I was a music therapist for both my births, I had training and more support and more understanding with my second one. So I started listening to my music really early, you know, just probably right after the first trimester and, and learned how to make playlists. And I remember there was a few playlists that I made and I would just listen to them and just cry. I would just cry so much. And to this day, I don't exactly know what I was crying about, but I was for sure getting out and processing through emotions that were, even to this day, um, pre-verbal. And that cleared the way for them to not be standing in the way of that birth. I had a very speedy birth, actually. And it just made it, it helped, I truly believe it helped make it possible for that unmedicated birth. And I've seen with my clients, it works in different ways for different people. So my experience is not necessarily going to be the experience of anybody who uses music therapy under the guidance of a music therapist for birth, but they all have something that sticks with them. When we review their birth, we listen to the music and we talk about the positions they were in. There's almost always one song that we just have to stop and like listen and you know, the emotions will come up and you can just 